got a, a, a special guest today, Dr. Stephen Golden. We're going to do an, an introduction on him in a minute. I'm down here in Cancun. I mean, Arizona is dry. It is like wet. Is that how that is in Texas? Is that Because I don't want to go to Texas if it's so wet. Okay. Larry, is it hot it down does. there? <laughs> it gets, you, it gets humid by the coast. We get a little moderate humidity where I'm at in Austin. And then as you get north, it gets dry again. We got every climate possible. We just don't have every season here. You know, I remember uh, growing up in Chicago, so, I was a human barometer. If it, if it got a little bit damp, all of a sudden my back, because, you know, my hip, I have my hip problems. It, it was like right away. Um, you know, I just, I love California's dry heat. Arizona, that's yeah. fine with me too. Got yeah, mighty I cold can't... in Texas recently, though, I understand that they did have a bit of a cold snap. So you do still have some seasons every 10 years, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, we get it for like oh. one or two days and that's it. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, that's why you'll see me doing this one. So I'm in the room with air conditioner. But before we get going, we have a section here we call what the F and we're going to do what the F even from here. So Larry, don't you have something you want to queue up before we bring what my what the F is this week? I do. I can't wait to hear it either. Uh, okay, sweet. Now we got a what the F. So, you know, my son was down visiting me, Kyle, and he was up coming from Washington. And he said, hey, dad, I got this noise going on when I ride. I go, well, could be your alignment. It could be your wheel balance. Uh, let's go check it out. So we drop it off at the uh, local tire store. And uh, I use this one because it was close by. I bring it in. Uh, he says, we'll call you on the diagnostic. So I'm thinking maybe alignment, right? He says, uh, yeah, it looks like you're going to, you, your, your front two tires look like they're shredding and we recommend you got to put all four tires on. And I'm like, okay, um, I don't know. What's the cost? 726 bucks. And I'm going, yeah, well, my son's, he's down here to visit. He's going back to Washington. Then he's moving to Japan. He's selling the car. So yeah, I don't think that's, what about just the front two tires and the back ones be fine? He says, well, yeah, but then the back two will shred too. And I go, yeah, that just doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm not a mechanic, you know, but I don't understand why that happened. So I said, let me think about it. We'll get back to you tomorrow morning uh, since we're, we're heading out to the Salt River. Everyone's in the car listening to the conversation. So I take Kyle back the next day. I said, look, we're going to go to a different tire store. He goes into the shop. He comes out and he goes, dad, they put all four brand new tires on my car. And that was a what the F moment for me. Like I go in and, you know, under the mask you can't see but i i always have this face that ron will tell you it looks like the face that i'm pissed i can't help it. it's my face right but when i am pissed it really starts to show so i'm in this guy's face i said look i was back here about two years ago before we had the the mars tournament stick fighting i had a remember i had my tire blown and roger had to get us there we were late yeah. so at that time before that they told me i needed all new four tires right and i said well i thought it was like maybe a not alignment thing or something no you got to get four tires oh you all have the problem so when I had that flat in LA, I said, how's my tires look? And they said, oh, they're all good. They just replaced the flat. And I told them, I said, four years ago, I mean, a couple of years ago, I came in here and you tried to sell me four tires. So this is what I think is happening, man. It's such, it's such, I don't know if I want to say crooked or scam, but a lot of that's going on. And I see that in a lot of different service industries now. You know, I don't know what your guys experiences on that, but I'm seeing a lot of that now. Yeah, the whole upsell thing. I mean, everybody's trying to make that buck and they're trying to just, you know, like the pressure you're into everything. I've gotten into the house so much. Uh, I had a plumbing thing and they're like, you know, you should really do this to the to all the bathrooms. I had, I had a problem with one pipe and it, 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 it's just upsell. Everybody's kind of got their, their, I don't know what you would call it, but griff be the right word. But you know, when, when you when you do this, yeah, it's it's uh, and it's egregious, more or less, depending on the industry. When they do that in the medical industry, that's when it really gets to me a what the f. If you go to a dentist, oh, you got to do a deep cleaning for two hundred dollars. They don't, and you got it. They're they're trying to sell you stuff, and I've got the dentist against the wall with my pissed off face, which looks pretty much the same as my face always looks. But you know, he could tell I was pissed off, and he's against the wall, just trying to assure me that legal guys. No, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna charge me four hundred bucks for stuff. I didn't need then they completely build everything they did actually a phenomenal job on the crown but they they fraudulently build six hundred dollars more than they were allowed to I had to go back and fight it so those sorts of things are bad enough in the auto industry but it's happening in the medical industry all over the place and that's where we're really vulnerable yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and you know you mentioned plumbing Ron we got a call about uh doing they, they'll use this hey we're doing a 72 dollar inspection you know uh and, and come check it out they came in 
and all of a sudden they're finding all these things that needed to be replaced. They bid it, they bid on it like $726. I called our local plumber. Yeah, a couple things. They had to replace the the um, garbage disposable, but we walked out with like about 300 bucks, you know, versus $726. Yeah, no. So, yeah, just uh, beware, I guess. Beware. Yeah, it, 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 it's everything. You know, it, I guess uh, what the F in relation to that could be our own ignorance and people capitalizing on it. I and mean, you, you just see people, I don't care if it's a carpet cleaner that comes in, but they all always kind of upsell you on the next thing and but you need that because of whatever so yeah what the f <laughs> capitalism <laughs> baby <laughs> Sorry, to be political. that's capitalism man that's so, so you want to add anything to that you, you you know um i've been you know because i deal with cars a lot i mean we, we had five over here back down to four finally trying to eliminate them slowly but surely but uh I've been fortunate enough. I mean, I, I only got one guy I let touch my cars because I feel like any other time somebody else touches my cars in any form of way, it just something goes wrong or, or, or the, the, the price doesn't work out right as they said it was, or all of a sudden they find something else. Or I don't know if you've ever had that weird feeling where like, you know, you get your car work done. You're like, cool, I got something fixed. And then you come home and it's like less than a week later and you're like, got to take it back again. And you're like, wait, I, I thought we just fixed that problem. You know what I mean? seems like these, there's another problem, but well, that problem that they supposedly fixed extended into something else, you know? Um, but thankfully, I, I've tried to just align myself with somebody that's just like A plus trustworthy, you know what I mean? Uh, well, I think if they know you're coming back, they're not going to play with you too much because they don't want to lose all their future business, which is absolutely. good business. Yeah. Yeah. So, and actually, funny story with that is the, the way I met this guy, we call him Beep, like, like Beep, right? But uh, his name's Barrett. And, and the way I ended up meeting Barrett was because I was going to kind of a, a shop, you know, a quick lube with multi-service type stuff going on. And uh, and I had a Nissan Ultima at the time. And then it just it had one or two times where it was great before and also one or two times and they kind of turned a little, you know what I mean? Something changed uh, dramatically. And so I, I called a buddy of mine, an old gearhead, and I said, man, look, I need somebody that's good. And he goes, oh, you should talk to him. He works on old cars and new cars. And I was like, okay. And that's been, I don't know, I would call it over 10 years now. Hey, uh, how about this, Ron? Because I, I haven't done the introduction. Why don't you do Dr. Golden's introduction since you have that long-term relationship with Okay, you. but to end what the F. Okay. Yeah. Any other time, you just want to choke somebody and lose the philosophy. Or the <laughs> philosophy becomes just choke that person. You know, that that's a matter of patience. And, and one of the things I've cultivated over my many years of old age is, is complete, my patience is inexhaustible. It's extremely difficult to ever get me to the point where I'm ready to grab someone and punch them. I've just, it just spent a lifetime saying my patience is my own, my morale is my own. My, the only thing you control in life is your attitude. That everything else is because you pretend you control, but you don't. And so if you lose control of your attitude, by losing your patience, shame on you. There are times where I will choose to not be patient because that's not the appropriate strategy. But no, almost never, which is totally not true. There's aspirations. Lots of times I get quoted pissed off about stuff. But yeah, I'm, I would say we're I'm trying here to put on a, a show, so you can run with me. We're polar opposite. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. That's why you, that's that's why I'm here, Ron. It's because every time you blow a gasket, Diana goes, Ron, talk to Steve first, for God's sakes, before you call this guy and hey, you know, and then I write it up. You know, you know how many times a day I have to call him? No. Oh man, that's that's my job. I'm glad okay, so let me tell everybody. All right, Dr. Stephen Gold has been in my life for probably 26, 27 years, maybe even more. I don't know. Uh I moved out to LA in just the beginning of uh, 93, I think. And he's one of the first uh, people that I met. He came to me because he had a, a couple of injuries. And, and I think, I don't know if you were in between martial arts schools or instructors. Yeah, I'd been abandoned twice by martial arts studios that closed. Yeah. And, and he started training with me and we hit it off. And I felt I was learning. I, I, I really ripped him off because I was learning as much from him as he was learning from me. And uh, it, it's really good, but he did get me in trouble. And I don't know if you know about that <laughs> because I had to modify things because of his injury and Guru Dan had asked me in class, run, show this. And I started doing it. And he looked at me, he's like, what are you doing? 
And I realized, oh no, it's when I modified to work for Steve and I looked like I was just totally blowing it. And, was, and, 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 you know, and then you try to do the explanation thing. He's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, just go on and get it right now, you know? But, um, but no, Steve is, is brilliant. Probably the smartest man I know. And I'm so happy to have him on. And I asked him if he would come on and do this and he was gracious enough to do it. And I asked him, would he mind touching on not just uh, the philosophy of Bruce Lee, but just philosophy in general. And for us laymen, this is, this is gonna be a killer show. So here we go. Steve Gold, are you ready? Meet, meet my well, audience. Thank you, thank you. I mean, well, I'm just delighted to, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time and haven't had the opportunity to do. And when I get soon enough to retirement, which I'm really pretty close to, I have kind of a book partly written in this area. And this is a chance for me to toss a few of those things out to people to begin the discussion. Uh, what I find is that, you know, philosophy is extremely complicated and very technical. And when you try to just make it up as you go along, I see more confusion in the martial arts community. A lot of good dialogue, but an awful lot of confusion where things are being mixed up all over the place. And until you break it down and understand how it works, and my goal, especially this book I want to do, is to create a primer where I can give you the language. Here's the words. This is what the words mean so that you can have tools for your discussion. And I'm not going to tell you what Bruce Lee means. I'm going to tell you what you need to know in order to have an intelligent discussion about, say, today we'll be talking about style without style. What does that mean? How can one talk a contradiction? That doesn't make any sense. How does one talk about that? There's some prior language to this. In some sense, you know, everybody's a philosopher, right? People will say everyone's a, because everyone thinks philosophically. What does that mean? If, if you're familiar with the word meta, when people say something's meta, meta means talking about something. I could talk about baseball and say that, what's the name of that Angels pitcher, Otana? Sergei, what, what was the name of that? You guys know the pitcher for the Angels. He's a Japanese pitcher, pitches play. He was the first, yeah. like yesterday, to, he, to, to be the number one in home runs and the number one in strikeouts in like 100 years since Babe Ruth. It's like an amazing statistic. Right. And uh, that's talking about baseball. Now, meta discussions would be, why do we have baseball? What does baseball do for us? Why does the movie, uh, you know, if you if you build it, they will come. Why does this ring with Americans? That's a philosophical question. We all do that to some extent or another. Some people are not. Well, let's use the word reflective. Some people don't think much. They just do what they're told. They go to church, they go to school, they do what they're told. But people who are reflective and think about things think philosophically, and that's a good thing. But philosophy is also a very highly technical discipline that's been around for thousands of years. A, a PhD is a, a doctorate of philosophy. That's what that means. It's a doctorate of philosophy, a doctorate of thinking about physics, math, history, whatever that PhD happens to be in. Uh, now, Bruce Lee is not an amateur. This is, this is the big distinction in our school. I, I've never heard Chuck Norris talk philosophy before. And one could talk about the philosophy of Chuck Norris if you want to, but all you're doing is imposing philosophical concepts on movies or things that he said. Bruce Lee was trained. He had an undergraduate degree in philosophy from the University of Wisconsin. He studied philosophy very closely. Now, granted, as an undergraduate. Washington, right? Not Wisconsin. University of Washington, yeah. And, and uh, it, granted, he didn't go on to become a professional philosopher, but he had the foundations for it. And if you want to understand the philosophy of Bruce Lee, what did he mean? What is he talking about? You have to understand the philosophical context that he was learning in, particularly the philosophy of pragmatists like John Dewey and American philosophers like that. Extremely important and were very, very popular in the 1960s and, and made a lot of, so when you know what Dewey and neo pragmatists say, it makes an awful lot of sense to see what Bruce Lee's talking about. So I'm gonna give some, I'm gonna go through, what I'm gonna do is give a real quick um, rundown of some basic philosophy concepts. Just give me 10 minutes, okay? I know a little philosophy lecture is a little tedious. If you got pencil and paper, I'm gonna tell you to write some words down. These are a handful of words you need to know in order to be able to talk sensibly about this. Just a couple more words before I do that, I mean, a couple more words about who I am. So we're not completely confused here. Um, you know, I'm from Los Angeles, but uh, I, I'm, I'm a graduate of the University of California, nine years BA through PhD. I have degrees in political science and history and a PhD in philosophy where I specialized in legal political philosophy, philosophy history. I was a philosophy professor. I published four books and dozens of articles. 25 some years ago, I went into online learning. I left academic philosophy and got into online learning and did, that's why I 
you know, philosophy doesn't make any money. I was pretty broke, but I did very well. I actually was founded a, the first university to offer the first PhD online. I've been doing online learning for forever. And uh, you work a lot uh, with the military too, don't you? Yeah. And that was kind of the interesting thing is that I pioneered online learning to the active duty military during the wars when it started in 99, 2000, 2001. I spoke to over 32,000 active duty members from Germany to Okinawa. I got so deep until the Joint Chiefs of Staff made me an honorary command sergeant major in the United States Army. I know every sergeant major. I used to know every sergeant major in the United States Army. And uh, I had everything from playing with their toys, letting me throw grenades and stuff. I trained with a level four combat instructor at Fort Benning. Uh, and, and so very, very and the, the stories I have about the U.S. military uh, will just, you know, I've, I've got another book on, on that. That's another show. That's another, that's a long show. And that's one that will, will I got to tell you some of the, some of the interviews I did for this book, I was crawling under the table and bringing things into a paper bag, trying not to hyperventilate, listening to the stories these guys were telling me were just uh, unimaginable. Uh, but I did yeah, that you, very you deep. Told me, you told me a couple of times that you've been on and you're like uh, in class and you're like, uh, I got to go. We're getting fired on. And oh, yeah. I had guys flying B-2 bombers, you know, in submarines. I had them chasing in Tora Bora, chasing Abu Sayyaf guerrillas in the Philippines. Hey, I got to jump down to the South Pole to pick up this doctor. It's like, that's not me jump down to the South Pole, dude. I saw that on National, National Geographic. That's a big deal. And uh, uh, the things that they went through in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, all through in Africa, you know, it really is, uh, those are fun stories for another time. Uh, now I'm actually the Associate Vice President and Chief Learning Officer for uh, Sophia University, which is a graduate psychology school. Uh, martial arts, I've been working with Ron forever. Uh, before that, I did some traditional Chinese martial arts. I have a disability, for, I had my leg crushed and my back broken in a motorcycle accident. 45 years ago. And so Ron, that's Ron's alluded to training me as a, as a cripple, the things that I can and can't do. And the adaptive, wonderful adaptations Ron has done for me over the years. So uh, that's just a little bit more about who I am uh, and uh, about the kind of stuff that I do. So when I study Bruce Lee's philosophy, I'm looking at it from the perspective of an academic philosopher and taking him seriously. This is really unique you will find only in a handful of traditions in say the very, very traditional Aikido program schools where they have a genuine philosophical master who is someone who is wide, not just someone who knows a lot of techniques and is a good fighter, but someone who's got deep, deep wisdom and knowledge beyond just everyday wisdom and everyday experience. And Bruce Lee was a trained philosopher. So let me throw out uh, three basic categories for you, okay? When you look at philosophy, and this is my simple five, 10 minute philosophy lecture to give you the language you need to be able to discuss here. We're gonna put philosophy into three basic buckets in a sort of logical way. You ask yourself first, what is it? What am I talking about? What is it? Then you ask, how do I know? I mean, what, how do I know this? And then you ask, what do I do? So if you say, what is it? How do you know, what do I do? There are three words for that. What is it is metaphysics, metaphysics, M-E-T-A and then physics. How do I know metaphysics? How do I know is called epistemology, E-P-I-S-T-E-M-O-L-O-G-Y, epistemology or epistemic. How do you know what you know? And the third area is ethics. What do you do? What's the right way to behave? Let me run through a basic understanding of what metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics is. Then we're going to go to the text. Because the reality, when I say, okay, uh, when I say, how do you know what Bruce Lee said? How do you know what his philosophy is? What kind of question is that of the three I just gave you? Is that a metaphysical, epistemological, or ethical question? Which I just gave you three. What was the second one I gave you? What is it? How do you know? No. That's an epistemological question. We often say epistemic. Ep ep the Greek word episteme just means science of knowledge. How do you know something? How, and there's a lot of ways to know things. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but but the you know how do you learn? We're getting, and that's what I'm going to ask you a little. How do you learn martial arts? How do you know this? How, when someone says this works and this doesn't work, how do you know? There's there's a lot of issues related. That's that's those are epistemological questions. Metaphysical questions is what is it? Like, what is a style? That's what we're going to get to. What does it mean to say it's a style, but it's not a style? That's the what is it? Okay, how do you know that? And then what should you do about it? So that's metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. Metaphysics. Metaphysics is this, okay, physics. Uh, 
The Greek word physis means stuff. Physis is stuff. Dirt, water, electricity, heat, cold. That's stuff. The physicist looks at how all this stuff interrelates. What happens when something gets really cold? How do you, is the bridge going to break, right? That's physics. Metaphysics is how do we talk about the world around us? What is it? What is the world? What, what, how did we get here? Why are we here? How do things work in the world? A, a question like, what is a style? That is a metaphysical question. Telling you, okay, if someone throws a punch at your face, catch it in a jong sao or a tan sao, that's a martial arts question. It's not a metaphys, it's a physical question. A metaphysical question is why do we do it this way? How do we understand who we are as martial artists? Now, there are two types of metaphysics. There are two types of metaphysics. There's idealist and materialist. Idealist metaphysics and materialist metaphysics. Idealist doesn't mean idealist like someone who is uh, always looking at, at the sunny side of life. Idealist means that there is permanent truth. There are ideas that are true in the universe, independent of human beings. So for example, if I told you two plus two is four, this is right, you guys are gonna argue with me, two plus two is four, right? It always has been right, it always will be right. There's nothing any of us can do to make two plus two equal five. That is true, it's always been true, and it always will be true. That's an example of an eternal truth that people want to hang their hat on. Another type of eternal truth, people who need to say there's some touch point, there's something in the world that I can hold on to beyond each of us, and from that build some sort of reality. This is where religion comes from. By and large, theology. Theology is a type of metaphysics. The world is made up how? Well, there's God, uh, there's the Trinity, there's a single God, there's reincarnation. There's a million ways that religions look metaphysically at the nature of the world. Most all of them are giving you some permanent truth for you to hold on to, some idealistic truth to hold on to. The second type, it's gonna be, which is where Bruce Lee is going to be going with stuff, is what's called materialist metaphysics. Materialist means you're just, the world around you is changing all the time, right? Everything's in constant change. Everybody's interim, nobody's permanent because everything changes. And this is scary. So a lot of people want to look for something permanent. Here, the materialist says there's no such thing as permanent. There's only what's happening in the world and how we sort of make up things to deal with it. The most important school, I'm a big fan of Friedrich Nietzsche, who is a material, metaphysical materialist, also going back to Aristotle. So Plato, this is Plato and Aristotle. Plato was an idealist and talks about real truth. And Plato talks about the highest concept is the good, G-O-D. And then what happens is Christianity knocks one of the O's off and the good becomes God. And Pl Plato's metaphysics is adopted into early Christianity by a guy named Boethius in the second century AD in a book called The Constellation of Philosophy, for which this philosopher was put in prison. They put a rope around the head and pulled it until his head exploded. So it's, it's philosophy is not always a popular subject, but that, that's how it's called Neoplatonism. So th this is the origins of Christian theology is in Plato and this idea of an eternal perfect truth. The opposite, the materialist view by Aristotle, Nietzsche, and John Dewey, an American philosopher of the early 20th century who was very influential on Bruce Lee, very influential at the time Bruce Lee was studying, very influential at the University of Washington where Bruce Lee was studying, though he was dead by then, he was from UCLA, but very influential. And what he suggests, the pragmatist, is that the world is changing all the time. There are no eternal truths. There's no, nothing that's always the same. What we try to do is make up ways of trying to deal with it. We're pragmatic. We're trying to solve problems. That's what we do. And so all of our fancy theories, all of our ideas are not about capturing some eternal truth. They're about just solving problems in the world. And the more you stop trying to find what's eternally true and just figure out a system for dealing with your problems, that's the best you can be. Okay, those are the two types of metaphysics. You're going to find that Bruce Lee falls in the second camp. Bruce Lee very clearly is a materialist metaphysics. He clearly has a metaphysics that is related to Dewey and the neo-pragmatists that I work on today. And I'm going to show you in the text. Second question, that's metaphysics. What is it? The second area of philosophy is how do you know that? Okay, you may say that this is true, but how do you know? Uh, and, and epistemologically, questions of how you know things, one way of knowing things is science. 
science is a wonderful way of knowing. It has a scientific method. You put out a hypothesis, you test it, you use statistics and tools and you see what kind of results you get. You modify your hypothesis. Science is a wonderful way of knowing whether you should wear a stinking mask, whether you should get an injection, whether listen to the science and stuff, because those are scientific questions. There are other questions that are not scientific questions. Why do I love my children? Should I love my children? Why is martial arts important to me as a human being? Those aren't science questions. Those are questions you have to answer in some other way. And I'm going to throw out, if we get to time a little bit later, why JKD is an art and not a science, according to Bruce Lee. There's a scientific component to it. It, it has deeply scientific components to it in the practice. But philosophically, it's an art because it's about personal expression more than anything else. Yes, it's about technology, technically being effective in combat, but it's about JKD is a life philosophy. It's a way of making yourself into the person you want to be. Or as Nietzsche says, become who you are. It's very hard to become. It's not as easy to become who you are as you think it is. Most people, most of us are trying to become somebody else. And, and this is what tra attracted me to JKD. I wasn't a fanatic Bruce Lee movie fan. I don't know if I'm mean, still, I love his movies, but I'm not sure I'm a fanatic. Bruce Lee, I was attracted more philosophically and then because Ron beat it into my head for a long time. That was a whole other story. Uh, but, but so th that's metaphysics. That's epistemology. How do you know? The third area is ethics. Ethics is what do you do? What's right conduct? How should people interact with each other? And here's what's really interesting. There are kind of three ways of looking at it uh, in American ethics. And Bruce Lee takes the third route, which is very similar, which is very much coming from Zen, from Buddhism, and from Eastern tradition. In the Western tradition, when we talk about ethics, you're going to talk about it one of two ways. You're either going to say it's for the greatest good. You should wear a mask because it's good for everybody and it protects other people. Or you should wear a mask because it's a bunch of baloney and it doesn't help you protect other people and it's just mind control. I don't care what side you're on. But you're doing it because of the consequences. What's want to be good for everybody. People are going to get hurt. People are going to be helped. That's one way. Second way Americans look at ethics is rights and duties. Forget the consequences. I have a right to do to live my life how I want. I have a right to free speech, a right to life, a right to uh, associate with who I want, a right to practice my religion, and you can't stop me. The, so that's the two ways we kind of balance, and we balance those things out. We say, oh, you got a right to something. You have a right to bear arms, no doubt. But are there any limits to your rights to bear arms based on safety to other people? Open question for another time. So that's how we usually do it. Bruce Lee goes in another direction, not a Western direction, but in more of an Eastern or more ancient direction. In, in the West, uh, this relates to what Aristotle calls virtue ethics. Virtue ethics is making, ethics is about making yourself into the best person you can be. And that's really where Bruce Lee lands. Bruce Lee's ethics and his ethics of Jeet Kune Do ties into his epistemology and his metaphysics. It's all going to tie together. And it ties together because Bruce Lee's fundamentally about self-development, about making yourself into the best human. You cannot be the best martial artist you can be unless you're the best human being you can be. And that's, that's, that's an ethic. How many martial arts studios do you see, <laughs> all of them, that have on their front window, we teach character and we teach virtue and we teach, do you? Do you really do that? Or how does teaching someone some basic blocking and striking techniques teach anyone any virtue or any ethical thing? Are you yourself an ethical person or someone who has a person of character? And here, we're not going to, you never see Bruce Lee talk about rights. You'll never see him talk about social utility. You'll see him talk about personal self actualization. So these are the three areas of philosophy in, I don't know, five, eight minutes, whatever it took me to do this to give you three basic bucket frameworks. You have, the, you have metaphysics, which is what is it? And it can either be an idealist permanent truth or a materialist, everything is in constant flux and we just do the best we can. The second area is epistemology. How do you know this? How do you know anything? How do you know what works and what doesn't work? That's, that'll be our biggest discussion, probably not today, but our biggest discussion of epistemology would be how do you know what works? And, and you know what my answer is? For the first 10 years, you shut up and do what Ron tells you to do. <laughs> I'm not ready to, to cut off anything that is, uh, it's nice to say you should, should discard and cut away, but you got to build up first. So there's this, you, we kind of listen, then you don't. That's when you need the stone to be a sculptor. You can't. And this is why. And, and you have to let it be until, and then there's a certain point where you're strip away. That's a piston. And then ethics, you'll find that Bruce Lee's about self-actualization. So let me stop there for just a second. See if there are any questions or comments I can answer. Then what we're going to do, 
I asked the question, how do you know what Bruce Lee said? Is that a metaphysical, epistemological, or ethical question? Which is it? Wait, wait, wait. Repeat the question again. I, I said, how do you know what Bruce Lee's philosophy is? How do you know? How do you find out? Is that a metaphysical question? Is that an epistemological question or an ethical question? I can't say it very well. <laughs> well, epistemological, or you can say epistemic. Sometimes we say epistemic more sure. It's an epistemic question. It's a how do you know question. Right. How do you know? He said, whenever you look at any philosopher or anyone you're trying to understand what they say, People say things in different venues. It's some places are more important than other places. What Bruce Lee said in a movie is probably the least important thing to bring up because that's a stage performance movie. I mean, it's not saying it's not true or not part of his ideas, but it's not a reputable. What Bruce Lee said in TV interviews, that's probably better because now he's sitting down and thinking and answering questions, but it's still a show and it's still a performance. And it's still an off the cuff. Read the book. The best way to know what Bruce Lee is, because he wrote these, he took the time to write this stuff down, to edit it, to say, this is right. These are my ideas. The best evidence, not to say the other evidence, then what happens is once you read this, then you start looking at the videos, watch, and then at the very end, you look at the movies and see how it brought into it. So you always begin with the text because that's all you really got to start with. So we're going to walk through some of the Bruce Lee text, get some comments to see if we can sort these things out and make some sense of things. Okay. Stopping for a moment. Any, any questions at this point? We had uh, one question from one of our guys online here. Um, was just basically asking, uh, what was there a particular reason maybe why Bruce Lee's uh, JKD yin and yang symbol went anti-clockwise, or I guess counterclockwise, maybe is what he's referring to. You know, I, I, that's a good question. I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but because, you know, I have no idea. But the, the one can speculate why Bruce Lee thinks things go, go differently than other people do. I mean, Bruce Lee, it's hard to say because he's really committed to uh, a, a Zen position He's really committed to the Buddhist position uh, of yin and yang balancing each other out. I'm not really sure. I have to look that up. Honestly, I honestly don't know. If, if we get a minute, I, I can pop up and, and see if I can find anything on that. But I know I don't know why he does that. Okay. Well, let's 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 stick with what's what. We'll yeah. Do. Good. Good. Uh, um, and it's it's so the most important thing a philosopher can do is say you have no idea. You know, a doctor will never do that. You go to a physician, they'll never say I don't know. They'll just give you, they'll say it's idiopathic, which means that they have no idea. But but uh, philosophers will be the first one to say, I have no idea, I have no idea what I'm talking about. So, okay, any other questions here? Shall we jump in? No, let's jump, jump in. Those of you who have it, if you have the Dao Jeet Kune Do with you, open it up and take a look at the first. Now, what we're gonna do is walk quickly through the nice thing, the Dao Jeet Kune Do is a preliminary book. He never finished it. This is a lot of notes that are put together. This is. This is the foundation of a book Bruce Lee was going to write. Okay, right. this isn't a Say again? This was made posthumously after he was gone. It was. And so what happens is you're weaving a lot of things together in a way that makes sense. But it's put together in the way that he wanted to. This is his preliminary book. If he had a time, he would have fleshed it out. The way the book is structured is there's some initial philosophy in the first 20 pages. Then the rest of it is technique about different, th different types, and then the very end is some more philosophy. So we're gonna look at the very beginning and the very end, and we're gonna look at it in order by the topics that he chose. Don't go start cherry picking things around, work through systematically. So if we look at the first chapter, he titles, or you know, title four, the first section is called On Zen. This is on page seven. And I'm gonna to read to you a couple things quickly. At the bottom of page seven, the localization of the mind means it's freezing. When it ceases to flow freely, it is needed. It is no more mind in its suchness. Okay, I'm going to explain that to you, and then we're going to jump to another one that's going to make a little more sense here. Um, the the what he means there is a there is there is a and I have a question for you guys on this. In Buddhist philosophy, this is a really important concept in Buddhist philosophy, the concept of suchness, okay? And let me explain quickly. The, the word for suchness in, in, in Sanskrit is tata, dada. It's like a very soft D. Have you ever heard of dadaism in the art 
culture. And what, the, and, and what it means is a completely unmediated experience. There's nothing in between you and what you're doing. And what they say is that when a child's first words are dada, in the West, we think that means he's talking about his daddy. We think it's patriarchal. Oh, look, he said dada. In, in the East, they say he said dada or suchness. This is the baby realizing for the first time that there's a world outside of himself. That, that there's an external presence, there's an external reality to me. At that point, the child is completely unmediated. There's no language, there's no culture, there's nothing to get in the way of the immediate experience of reality. Okay, so what happens in Buddhism? A, a bodhisattva, that's someone who has achieved enlightenment, who has done all the things as a Buddhist you're supposed to do, withdrawing from want, withdrawing from things, withdrawing from need, until you become released from all the pain and drama of, of the world. And when you die, you go to nirvana, which is a place of just complete peace. That um, uh, bodhisattva is also in, in, called a tatargata, which means one who comes suchly. Okay, one who comes suchly is one who comes in a completely unmediated experience. Tell me, if you get into a street fight like that, why is it important not to have mediation between you and what's happening? You'll, in other words, why don't overthink it? Yeah. It'll cause pause. It won't be reactionary. Is that it? I don't know if that's it, but... Uh, do you, do you, when, when you go in, whether you're sparring or anything else... Are you thinking, you know, Ron, you, one of the things you always used to criticize Wing Chun people about was you always told me the over, the over, um, over analyzing, the over academic, you do this, I'll do that, you do this, I'll do that. When you have set forms, my reaction is to do these four things automatically, whatever you throw at me. Well, you know, not true freedom, man. You want what to is not true freedom? When they say no mind, have you ever heard this expression in Asian philosophy? What does it mean to have no mind when you go into a fight? Tell me what you think that means. Well, the Japanese call it mushin, and mushin is being no mind, being open, and just cognitive to the environment and to be open to reaction, the way I, I take it. Um, you know, I could go into, uh, uh, it, it, uh, there was a book that I, I always talk about, I think I've talked about it on here. It was called uh, Bruce Siddle, uh, uh, Sharpening the Warrior's Edge. And he was an under, underwater diver. And he realized that when he was underwater, his reflexes were much more uh, precise or faster, or quicker underwater than when he was on dry land. And after just simple uh, research on his, on his own, he figured out that those goggles cut off a lot of the world yeah. and his brain didn't have to process all this. But when your brain has to take in this whole thing, you're working a lot. The brain's working a lot. And if you become no mind, you're just in the moment and you're just reactionary and you're open up to something that may come at you. You're absolutely in the moment. Why, why do we do chi sao or who but or sensitivity trains? Why do we do that? What's the point of chi sao? I look at it as a drill. And, and drills, like a lot of people will put down drills. And where Bruce Lee was, after you learn a drill, forget the drill. But you're not really forgetting it. You know, like no. uh, 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 Sifu Jan and Asana will always say that you know, the whole thing about Bruce Lee being anti-form. He said he was the best formsman I've ever oh, I'm sure. seen. Well, and he's not anti I'll show you where he's not actually anti-form. He's not, but, he's clear. But, but that's what people say. Yeah, yeah. Is what I'm saying. And, and what he did is he learned the form, but he wasn't bound by it. It was the whole building of the, remember the whole grave, the casket thing? Yeah. Here lies the, yeah, yeah. the, the traditional man. You know, and, and with Mushin, I, I feel that you're no mind. You're just there. And then you're just reactionary. You're not going to be, pre uh, you're not going to, it's not the time for research. It's time for reaction. It's to yeah. just let go and be in the moment. One of the things, you know, I learned in, in training in ninjutsu years and years ago with Stephen Hayes, you know, we talk about physical manifestations of earth, fire, wind, water, but the ultimate is to get in coup or void where you're just going with the flow. You take out the thought process because you know, in a fighter situation, oh. what hurts you a lot of times, like you say, overthinking instead of reacting and, and acting. You know, one of the things I've been seeing with football, I mean, a lot of them try to get into thinking, but it's, I always would say, look, react, act, react, act. Don't try to make decisions yet because you're feeling it. And one of the things about Chi Sao or Hubud is we're based upon feel. We're not really, we're sort of circumventing the thought process, right? Am I right? The, the, the Indonesians have a term called Pichihan. Pichihan is when you, if you have like a vase and you dropped it and it shattered, 
It's just a piece of the puzzle. So it, it's what you would call Cliff a broken play in football. It's like, oh my God, we can't reset because this guy's covered. And we, you know, every time we train this play, this is what we had to do. We had we learned how to recover from a broken play and just go on without. I mean, I can't say there's not a thought process to it, but it's just an opening. It's 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 drilling. It's rope brought in you by rope. Oh, this happens, react that way. This happens, react that way, and you minimize reflex time. I had a blog I, I started kind of uh, pushing out a wall back about different levels of discipline, and I kind of related self discipline and mushin to to something of similarity, you know, because. I might wake up and make my bed. I don't have to think about making my bed anymore, but I might've had a little bit of remedial or preventative discipline that kind of helped shape me that way as I was growing up, you know? So there's definitely that repetition and that drilling that comes out that then turn it on like a light switch. It's it's like, it's nine o'clock in the morning. You're supposed to be at work at nine. You go, oh my God, you jump up. You could throw your shoe on. I gotta take the lace and pull it tight and loop it and wind a loop. You could do that hopping on one foot, trying to grab the donut as you're running out the door. You know, it's just, it's a part of you. So you're doing things again by root. And so I, it's, a deep, not by root. it's a deep part of your life. These are habits, but it's a deep part of your life and how you're structured. Okay, all the years run, you know, train me. And I, you know, you do things right, you get hit in the head. And so whether it's learning to use, I'm, I love the Mook John and my dummy. I actually found, <laughs> fell out of my book as I was pulling the Dow G condone. I got all my dummy forms there. But, but the, the, uh, um, you're so you're, we all talk about structure and structure being proper and being natural. Okay, as someone who's disabled, uh, and I move better or worse than other times, I was three years on crutches after this last one. Uh, and every time I go to a door, like to walk into the front door of the school, big glass door, someone would push it open, it's coming right at my face. I immediately, bah, my hand goes up. Does it matter if it's a fist or a door? It's going to hit you in the face. You got to block it one way or another. The structure, it's just I'm not following it up with a back fist unless I'm really in a bad mood. But the, the idea is that since I have proper structure, it's, I don't even think about it. It just comes out. And it, it needs to just, it needs to be so drilled into you that it can just come out because there's just no time to think about it. That's true of all in extremis, in extreme situation, in extremis decision-making. I have a study in a part of a book going out, published parts of this on uh, what I call the wisdom in the army command sergeant major. And, and it's about wisdom in in extremist decision making. My research partners in Germany and Australia had done this research with uh, firefighters and frontline workers and policemen. I brought them in and we were doing it with the Sergeant Major Corps in, in the U.S. Army. And I was arguing that the kind of wisdom after 30 years of combat experience and military experience of making things happen, which is what Sergeant Majors do as opposed to generals who are all strategy. It's a very different kind of wisdom that develops and becomes intuitive, it becomes quick. Your decision, you don't have time to sit there and think about this stuff. When you're in combat or in a war situation or you're in a, any kind of immediate, this stuff has to come out and be part of you, it has to be internalized and you have to let go and let the mind go. And so what Bruce Lee says, it's really interesting that we read you a couple more on page eight. Wisdom does not consist of trying to wrest good from evil but in learning to ride them as a cork adapts itself to the crests and troughs of the waves. This is clearly a materialist metaphysic. This is the, the life is, is a wave going on. It's good and bad happening all the time. You're not going to separate them out. You just got to ride it in a way that makes a lot of sense. Um, and if you go to page nine, there is no fixed teaching. All I can provide is an appropriate medicine for a particular ailment. That's what I called pragmatism. There's no truth to every, I can't tell you the secret of martial arts. I can't show you the one move that's going to protect you. All I can do is help you deal with your problems. The medicine for your ailment may be a really good bong sao and a pop to the back of the head. So, um, you know, part of, you know, what, you know, you'll see Bruce, Bruce quotes that, you know, like my truth is not your truth, but you mentioned earlier, part of his background in, what he learned in philosophy in, in the course he chose is the self-actualization of discovering self-discovery. So you kind of, he can't tell you like, this is the way because your way is going to be different because of your experiences. Is that right? Is that what we're completely, kinda... completely. So listen, every body is different. Every, every, every life. I, okay. I got, I'm kind of crippled up. I can't jump, can't run. Can't, that's just me. I'm also old. I'm also really strong, but I'm also here in, in Southern California. I'm not in Hong Kong. I'm not fighting people. In the I'm not going to go into the octagon anytime soon. 
my problems or my diseases that need to be treated, the medicine is going to, are not going to be your problem. My challenges are not your challenges. My abilities are not your. Each of us seeks our own path and creates our own JKD. We create each of us, you know, if you get to, here's on page 12, with a little further down, we talked about Jeet Kune Do. The art of Jeet Kune Do is simply to simplify. It is being oneself. It is reality and isness in the being of who you are. Thus, isness is the meaning. Having freedom is its primary sense, not limited by attachments, confinements, partialations, conceptualizations. Go further. Jeet Kune Do favors formlessness, so it can assume all forms. And since Jeet Kune Do has no style, it can fit with all styles. As a, as a result, Jeet Kune Do realize, utilizes all ways and is bound by none to serve its own ends. Uh, and when you get... Um, I don't want to get into these critiques, whatever, we're kind of too much time. But yeah, it, it, it becomes that not only is your body different and your life is different, but your process of self-actualization is different. Becoming who you are, so I've got children and grandchildren, I'm an academic, I do all sorts of stupid, books, play guitar, and stuff. that's what makes me who I am. What makes you who you are is going to be very different. So in other words, Jeet Kune Do, Tao, when we say the Tao, Tao means way, it means path. It doesn't mean truth. So he's not using the word truth with a capital T to mean permanent truths. He's talking about T, truth with a small T. These are your truths and my truths. They're true for you. And they may not be true for me. And each, this is the pragmatist view of this. I'm not looking at an idealist metaphysics of a perfect world or telling you what God said to do. And I'm not giving you the right way. I'm helping guide you to find your own way. And, and that to become actualizing who you really are. Let me jump ahead a little bit. So what does this mean? I got two other questions for you. Let me get my other, where I put this one, because I had another question for you guys. Then I want to get to kind of the big money pitch here. That's really important. Here it is. So this is on the art of the soul. I have it on page nine. It might be page two. It's right at the beginning of the section that's called the art of the soul. I want to read you two passages and I want you to comment. The aim of art is to project an inner vision into the world, to state in aesthetic or artistic creation, the deepest psychic and personal experiences of a human being. It is to enable those experiences to be intelligible and understood and generally recognized within the framework of the world. Okay, going on, if you flip the page, you'll go a few down. Art is never decoration, embellishment. Instead, it is work of enlightenment. Art, in other words, is a technique for acquiring liberty. If all you do is teaching techniques on how to do something, you're not doing any philosophy. My question to you guys, and now one, I know we're running out of time, then I want to close on something important, but how, Jeet Kune Do has scientific components to it, but fundamentally it's an art. If it's about self-actualization, about becoming the person, you, you can't be a complete JKD player unless you're a complete human being. How do you guys do that beyond technique? How do you do that in your schools with your students? How do you communicate that? We've got a like a topic of the month that we cover, kind of like uh, some groups use the powerful words or things like that. Um, so every month we rotate a topic. Let's say like right now we've been working on the topic of change and what does that really mean, you know, across each part of your of your life. And so we relate it with both, uh, you know, kind of a description each week that modifies itself. And then we relate it with a question for the student body to reflect on, and then maybe one or two quotes. Um, and, and we kind of kind of go around that, I guess, and, and keep that pattern going as we grow. It was interesting at a, a black belt student of ours actually uh, one time tell, don't you think that stuff's kind of cheesy? I mean, I get it. You're trying to do character development and all that. He goes, but we get that inherently when we do martial arts training. And I was like, Okay, Roger that. I said, so because we do punches and kicks and blocks, we get character development. He goes, yeah. And I said, then what was wrong with the Cobra Kai's and Karate Kid? And he was like, point taken. <laughs> yep. So it's not enough. It's, it's part of it's not enough. Ron, how do you do it? God, you know, a lot of, a, a, a lot of the, the way that I do it is, for one, all right, I, I don't know if I'm going to answer the question correctly, but if you think of uh, uh, one must not uh, uh, just do what or one must not apply, one must do. You know, uh, I, I can teach technique, but somebody has to live it. 
And a lot of times I've had instances with people that I've trained that they go, and I'll just say it the way that they said it. And I don't agree with it sometimes. And I try to, I'm the, I'm the ultimate crude guy, but I try to, I try my best during a class, but somebody will be, be like, I can't believe that shit worked. And, and I got to do a head shake first uh, when I do it. And, and I'll, I'll try to break it down for them. I'm like, you know, if you believe that this does not work, you're correct. You have to believe in what, what you do and to believe what you do you have to experience. I've trained a lot of people who come from an Aikido background and I love Aikido and I'm not putting it down, but they want to be like more Aishiba and they want to be the gentle path, the gentle way. I don't think that they can achieve that without walking his walk. There was a time that more Aishiba was a little ass kicker and he went through a lot and he, he kind of had this enlightenment and learned the gentle way but they're trying to achieve it without maybe stress testing some of the stuff or pressure testing. And that's my whole goal is, you know, nothing taught me better than a swift kick in the butt. And, and, and I don't mean that my dad was doing that, but I meant, you know, I had to touch the hot stove. And I, I learned for a lot of people that they have to learn. I got to sit back. Sometimes I could sit there and watch my son and say, don't, 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 don't. But sooner or later, he's going to just defy me and he's going to put his finger on the stove and burn himself. And I, and I wait for those moments, sometimes with great pleasure, sometimes with, oh, and, you know, great stress. And, and I realize after that is when the true lesson can come, where I can get somebody to, to, to see why we do things the way we do. You know, Steve, there, there's a ton of times that I've taught people. And I'm like, why isn't this person getting this? Why isn't this person getting this? And it'll be from something that I used. I got it from something I used to do that I no longer do that I've never taught them. But I'm expecting them, let's just put your hand here. Why aren't they putting it there? But again, through, through another life and another time, I was doing these things. And it brought me to that realization of how to get there. Right. And, and I realized sometimes I gotta <coughs> help with people and, and, and you gotta kind of spoon feed them where you can't always just give them the fishing pole. You have to fish at times for a person. So I don't know if I'm answering the question. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Cliff, did you have any comments kind of on how you teach? Well, and I would call yeah, this, yeah. by the way, wisdom, developing wisdom as opposed to knowledge. How do, how do you develop wisdom? Well, part of what I would do, and, and I, I did this in a course that I put together years ago, it was the Satori. It was really kind of an awakening to really bring yourself to different level of consciousness. One of the exercises you know, I would do part, partly is, Again, to kind of find out how you deal with the situation, I would have my students just kind of like face each other. They can't talk, but just stare at each other in each other's eyes. Kind of finding within, like, where's your fear? You know, can you look at this person in your eye? And I would tell them, like, here's an exercise assignment I want you to do for self-discovery. And this is kind of cool to do. I mean, and you don't know what you're going to get from that. But I, I found this. I don't, can't remember who shared this with me years ago, but I'd go in front of a mirror and I would stand and look at myself in the mirror. And, and, and it brought tears to myself. It, you, you, it, it was like, you cannot lie to that person in the mirror. Frosty Westering, a great coach, taught me to do that. The man in the mirror, that's where I got that from. He said, and I thought, that's cool. And I did it. I looked in the mirror and I'd stare at it. And, and all of a sudden, things open up and you see things, right? Because mm -hmm. we hide behind a social mask. And so it kind of got me to my inner self. And I would introduce this to my students. Like, look, this is part of your self-discovery. Find out who you really are instead of this person that we hide behind and try to be like other people. Like, this is who we really am. So I'd use exercises like that along with meditation to kind of teach my students, look, this is not the physical part, but this is important in your ability to develop as a martial artist. Mm -hmm. So, so like that. absolutely. So for, for Bruce Lee, they got two kind of, we're coming towards the end. So I want to have two specific things. First, in, in comment with this, we're talking about developing wisdom, not knowledge. Knowledge is the ability to do techniques. Wisdom is the ability to understand why. Uh, if we, I don't have time to go through it here, but it was so fun to read, read through this again more closely for this project. I really got more, you go more of it each time. Read closely, you know what you'll find out? Bruce Lee's answer to this question is build people's self-confidence build their self-esteem. That's what it says in the book. I'm not going to pull the quotes out here, but if you want to develop wisdom, get people to feel good about who they are so they can become that and be authentically who they are. And Bruce Lee seemed to be very committed about building self-esteem and confidence. He talks specifically about fear, that fear here is, fear comes from uncertainty. We are absolutely certain whether our worth or worthlessness, we are all, it, when we are absolutely certain whether uh, our worth 
or our worthlessness, we are almost impervious to fear. Thus, a feeling of utter unworthiness can be a source of courage. Everyone, I'm going to go into this in more detail. The, the point he's basically making here is fear comes from a lack of sense of control. You feel like you don't control things in life. It, that's why control freaks are always the most fearful people anywhere. The way to reduce fear is to create self-confidence, is to get people. And that's what you guys are doing. You're building not just people's minds, but bu building their confidence to say, I can make my own Jeet Kune Do, because Bruce Lee says, uh, to, he says, Jeet Kune Do is the art not founded on technique or doctrine. It is just as you are. And the just as you are is in script. He's, he's emphasizing that. Jeet Kune Do is nothing more than you being just who you are. How do you get people to be just who they are? By encouraging self-confidence so they're willing to. Now, I got one last comment I want to make, and we can, I'm glad to stay on longer if you want me to. But when we talked about metaphysically, what is a style? There's a wonderful section here when he talks about traditional styles. He calls it organized despair. That's a wonderful word for it, that traditional styles are organized. He says, don't ignore them. If you ignore original uh, traditional styles and you don't do forms, that's just as bad. Now you're creating your own limits. You should be limitless and try anything and everything to see what will work for you. Uh, but in doing this, what is Jeet Kune Do? And this is really important because this is what's got to stop and got to stop now. I have the right Jeet Kune Do. I know Jeet Kune Do better than you do. I have the real Jeet Kune Do. I'm not going to wade into discussions of concepts versus attributes, though I can tell you attributive theory or the nature of conceptual analysis is extraordinarily complex. And what I read is mind-bendingly embarrassing philosophically. But the reason people worry about these sorts of things is because of power and money. Knowledge, I'm going to read you the final quotes, but knowledge is power. And I don't mean that if you have knowledge, you'll become powerful. I mean that what it is to be knowledge is power. If I have the true knowledge, you got to pay me to learn it. He doesn't have the true knowledge. I do. And since I have the true knowledge, you got to give me the money. These fights over what is Jeet Kune Do and what is not Jeet Kune Do are strictly money power gambits. They're grifts. And, and, I'll, and I'll read to you the proof of it. Let me read to you the proof of it. At the very end, page 2000, the very, very end of the book. So it's the most important thing he has to say. His last three quotes. Self-knowledge is the basis of Jeet Kune Do because it is effective, not only for the individual's martial art, but also his life as a human being. That's our first point. Our second point, learning Jeet Kune Do is not a matter of seeking knowledge or accumulating style pattern, but is discovering the cause of ignorance. Jeet Kune Do is fine. And here's the most important, the last thing he says, and everyone should paste this on your school. If people say Jeet Kune Do is different from this or from that, then let the name of Jeet Kune Do be wiped out, for that's what it is, just a name. Please don't fuss over it. So Bruce Lee is very clear. There's another place where he says the name should be wiped from the face of the earth. If people start saying, this is Jeet Kune Do, this is not Jeet Kune Do. There's no such thing. Each of us walks our own path. If you are walking an inauthentic path that's not you, that's not Jeet Kune Do. And, and that I think we can fairly say. But to say this technique or this process, for me, for someone who can't run, jump, kick or whatnot, not, Things like hubud and and trapping and and joint locking and uh, um, and and chi or and and a mukjong or my mukjong is my only friend. I don't have any other friends. I get I don't get to play with anyone else. I live a I've very a lot of to mine too, uh, endlessly, endlessly. So so to close this out, I, I want to say that that stop fighting over what Jeet Kune Do is or isn't, and make yourself into the best person you can be. If you want to be a good martial arts teacher, be a good person. Learn how to develop wisdom and character just as much as you learn, but understand that as, there are as many different Jeet Kune Do's as there are Jeet Kune Do players, period. That, that's my basic message. And I got to awesome. amen, get a hallelujah. Yeah, no, no, that's awesome because, you know, I mean, it's it's the main fight everywhere. You know, like the, the main things I see are uh, Jeet Kune Do really sucks. It doesn't really work or Jeet Kune Do that's not real, real Jeet Kune Do what they're doing. And I've gotten it. I've gotten hit on a lot for it. Look at Ron. He's in a left. Uh, 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 he's fighting in his right leg. We know the Jeet Kune Do thing is in a left leg. All these ridiculous statements have come at me and, and hit me. 
And then I, I've got uh, like through this whole MMA world now, how many chicken mill players are in there? How many times have you seen this trap or whatever else? And I go, they just don't get it. No. They, they and you know what? Every one of them, to some extent as a JKD player, because they're all doing mixed martial arts. Each one of them is picking out from arts. Well, I want to use a Thai move, he Thai boxing move on my elbows. My kick is going to be more like this. The, the best MMA guy, Bruce Lee is the original MMA person because that's neo pragmatism. That's pragmatism. Pragmatist is philosophy is don't take truth as an existing thing. Find out what works for you. And if someone says Jeet Kune Do it has to be uh, both sides, you have to be, be, be just as comfortable in right and left. I don't have a left lead. I can't do that physically. I will fall flat on my face if I do that because my left leg doesn't work all that well. I am solely in a right lead kind of crunched up thingy here to make sure nobody kicks me. You know, yeah. and <laughs> you once told me a story. I think you were at a ZZ Top concert with your son. <laughs> And somebody messed with him or something, and all of a sudden you're like, "Ron, my leg was great for like 30 seconds." 30 seconds, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> so you know. Yeah, that was actually yeah. insane. That was actually the insane clown posse. So it was oh, like, it was insane clown posse. <laughs> even worse. Wow. So let me ask you this, Steve. My son, like, yeah, because the. I mean, there is so many, so many arguments on who's got the right Jeet Kune or there's like the original Jeet Kune Do, or you know, again. To me, the whole idea is if you are going to discover who you are, you've got to experience. You've got to, if you're limited already to one style and go, you don't change, then you're really not Jeet Kune Do. If you take what Bruce Lee gave you and say, this is Jeet Kune Do, then I think you kind of lost the way, well, right? It's, the whole it's really thing is about, you're frozen in time because the man yeah. died, so it can never evolve anymore. Mm -hmm. And you, 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 you're, 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 not following it you're not following it saying that it's freedom and, 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 and it's self-knowledge. You know, if we all stuck with a Model T Ford, you know, cars would be kind of, ugh, no, we would never progress. We already well, said, I'll have, hey, something that works. I, I'll have students, Ron, that come, you know, got their black belt like in 98 or 2000. They come in, they join me now and they go, but, but you were teaching the bob and weave more back like that. And I go, well, yeah, but that's for MMA. Now I've got to worry about someone double leg takedowns. I got to worry about getting the knee. I modified that. I mean, that's the whole thing about, to me, Jeet Kune Do is, you gotta, you gotta go with the flow. You're gonna it, constantly, you know, yeah, it, go with the, the changes, right? Like when I wrote the book, I got a lot of heat for our, the name of our book, Steve, Principles mm. of a Complete Fighter. And they're like, oh, you're a complete fighter. I go, no, I have the principles of it though. I yeah. know what I need to do to better myself. If I don't follow it, then shame on me. I'm not following the concepts that I'm trying to push, but I'm, I'm just trying to show conceptually what I can do to advance and maybe not to just be a big fish in my pond, but to be able to survive and swim in somebody else's pond. Yeah, but and you know what's interesting about that though is that you know you always have to remember people are on different levels in this sort of in the practice. Not Bruce Lee was largely talking to experts. He wasn't talking to beginners. I don't. I think he let Dan and Asano teach the newbies. Bruce Lee seemed focused, and this book is clearly written to advanced martial artists. You don't start in in martial arts by stripping away. You don't have anything to strip away. You got to shut up and do what your teacher tells you and learn how, epistemologically, epistemically. How do I know what will work you know what i don't i've never been in a fight with anybody i don't even spar i just train a lot and there's certain things i'm really really good at uh, about four four or five things but you know how i know it works because ron tells me it works i trust ron and i've had willie loriano or other good teachers who taught me stuff and i, I trust and then i can see and in my mind i can see what's going to work and what's going to work for me so if someone says oh you have to uh I, i've heard jkd people tell me um I'm not that for that defanging the snake stuff, snake stuff that Panatukin or even, even any of the joint locking. I just want to split entry, go in and hit the guy. It's faster. That's original JKD. Okay. But what you're doing is you're denigrating me. You're, you're, you're putting down me as an authentic human being. Because in my life, for not just my disability, but also the world I'm in, I'm not in a world where generally I want to go in and beat the hell out of somebody. If I'm in a confrontation, it's going to be one, I'm going to want a quick joint lock, a quick joint break, take that arm out and see if the guy will run away before it turns, before I turn around and run the other direction. And so for when I think reflectively about who I am and what I need to do, you're saying that I'm wrong. I can't be wrong. It's my life. That's the whole point. Because if it comes back to like the Fosbury flop, mm -hmm. You know, because everybody's like, you can't jump over that way. He's jumping over backwards. It's not going to work. So they're they're uh, um, they're judging the art on their lame ass. Sorry, you know, yeah. they're, they're 
they're putting blinders on you or they're they're putting a a, a, a harness on you where if you're if you're like oh you know i always talk about this story steve uh when i first started stunt work i, I was nice enough there was a, a stunt coordinator named jeff Pruitt, and i was doing power rangers sorry but i was doing power rangers and um apologize to me i think it's cool he, he would give a lot of guys a chance jeff was an amazing stuntman and, and a lot of newbies yeah come on if he thought that you weren't going to hurt somebody and you had some control have at it and he brought this guy on and this guy was doing this amazing stuff and jeff ran up he's like where'd you get that from he was i watched it in this one like hong kong action film and he was i know that film and it was back in vhs days so he brought the film in the next day. He goes, show me where that's at. And the guy forward fast or fast forward, whatever, to the point where he's seen the, uh, that scene. He goes, right there. And Jeff goes, that's a wire gal. And he goes, oh, I don't know. I just did it. So this kid wasn't told that that couldn't be done. If I had, if he had been told, he probably would have tried. tried it. But he figured it out how to do it without wires because he had no ceiling. And he was just creating, and we we would have judged it on our lame ass. Yeah, and yeah. It had no boundaries. So that's and why that's, when I see somebody doing something, I'll just sit back and watch. Sometimes I just want to see what comes out of it. And and sometimes you know, yeah, it's the expected result. But at other times, I go, oh my god, this is brilliant. They went somewhere I never thought they'd go. Well, and, and Ron, I think I think the 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 you and I've been together forever, and I think the as a teacher. One of the things I've always appreciated about your teaching style is, is it's extremely respectful. You, you, you respect, you, and, and this is something any, any uh, martial arts trains and teaches, is treating other people with respect and knowing that their truth isn't going to be your truth, that your truth, you can't make them do things the way you, I've seen it, I was in a traditional, for about 20 minutes, I went to a traditional uh, uh, Chinese studio here in Torrance a few, some years back, and I'm watching these people who are, some are really good. Some are, you, dude, you're just not set out for this. You're a stocky little guy. You're supposed to be jumping up in the air. and You're just not, not a fit for this style. They're trying to shove you in this little box. You always treated your students with respect, uh, and which is given how disrespectful you usually are to us in, in terms of the way you talk, <laughs> the inactuality in terms of the ethic. It was always a, a, a question of treating people with respect. And, you know, it's it's not saying training with you isn't frustrating because you you intentionally frustrate your student, you know. And you remember the time I asked you, I go, I go uh, early on, I remember asking you um, 20 years ago, okay, I'm training martial arts and people are saying, well, I just have a gun, you know. There's nothing you can do. I'll just pull out my gun and shoot you. And I said, what am I supposed to say to that? And you got on my face and started screaming at me going, where's your gun? Where's your gun? And I didn't know what to do. So I pulled my finger out and smacked my hand really hard. Shit. And did this like three times. And you go, where's your gun? Where's your gun? I three, smack my hand again. I said, okay, I'm supposed to smack your hand. You go, no, stupid. You don't have a gun. You know, that's the whole point. These people say stuff. You couldn't just tell me that. You couldn't just say, Steve, no, the answer is they don't have a gun. So I'm not saying learning from me was always easy, uh, but is always respectful for who I am and my path. And that's what really mattered. You know, yeah. one thing you brought to my attention today about Bruce and, and the fact, you know, he talks about that Jeet Kune Do is not the accumulation of knowledge, but it's really elimination as you, because mm -hmm. again, directing toward people who are experienced martial artists. I think, I mean, it's the same way in photography, you know, when I started out, man, I got to get all these lens, but really, you know, I can do pretty much everything with one lens, one light. I don't need all that because why my expertise comes there. I need less as we get older. What do we do? We start getting rid of things because we don't need them because we, what we've invested is really ourself, right? So the object things that we collect don't seem as important. And I find myself, I don't need it. I don't need it. I really invested in me. And I think it just, it, it's part of what you talked about. Bruce Lee is developing our confidence. This is what we become. This is who we, we realize we are in our life. And those things that we hung on to are not as important, right? So it's it really well, we, eliminating we a lot of my junk in my life. Yeah, but you, you needed it to begin with. When right. you were first learning and you said, how do I know how to be a good photographer? I'm that way with musical instruments. And stuff. I needed all these other things to be able to produce this result. As I've learned and grown, I found I don't, I can, I, there are other ways to do this. There are simpler ways, better ways, more efficient ways to solve the problem, not to seek truth but to solve the problem and do the job, to be pragmatic and get it done. You get, as you get old, you get better and better and better at it. And, and you find you don't need all this. You, you needed those things before. It's not like you didn't, but you evolve out of them. 
And the uh, knowledge and, thing about power again gets to it. What is it? You got all these photographers trying to. Sell. This is the, what you got to have. This is what you need, right? We all do that, and it's it's in every industry. It's always about trying to sell something that people think that if I get this, it's going to make me more powerful. If I get this lens, it's going to make me a better photographer. And that's but it really isn't about that, right? We're, we're, we're right back to our what the f moment here, aren't we? Let's <laughs> <laughs> kind of bring it all full circle to close it up. I got I a good uh, quote question, here that uh, right, came out uh, of. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go on. Oh, there's a, a good quote I, I'd written down, I guess, uh, Monday, actually. No, it's like a week ago, Monday. Said, it is indeed difficult to see the situation simply. Our minds are very complex, and it is easy to teach one to be skillful, but it is difficult to teach one his own attitude. That's also Bruce Lee. Is, and that, that's precisely an epistemological question. That's a question of how do you know, how do you learn, or we call a pedagogical question, a question of teaching. How do you teach? And, and when we get a chance to do this again, the next things we'll get into, we, we, we might, okay, we know the famous say, absorb what is useful. We all know that one. Everyone focuses on the useful part, which is the pragmatist solving problems. I'm very interested in understanding what we mean by absorb. I, that, that's, a, that's a unique way of no, epistemologically absorbing isn't just learning. And what happens, I notice, I, you know, God help me, I sound like Ron, I move like Ron. You know, it's like the things that I do, you just soak it up. And, and one, you know, and we, if we do these further on, uh, that's the kind of thing we would get into next. So epistemologically, how do you know? How do you train? How do you, we, we've got the objective now. There, there's no right way to do things. Everybody's on their own path. As a teacher, we're there to help them through self-confidence, cultivate their own path to be the best person, the best JKD player that can be, period, full stop. Now, how do we do that? How, how do you build self-confidence? How do you get them to, if you want to talk about absorbing, the first thing is being a role model because they're watching. You. It's like be, being, a, being a good parent, being a good person. The kids don't listen to anything you say, but they watch everything you do when they imitate you. And so it's the same thing with teaching. I imitate Ron all the time, which is sometimes hilariously funny, but that's another story. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to get you to be on every week. But anyway, I, uh, let, me, let me get past that and go, I'm going to read up a question. Randy Sear there, he said, uh, preference is what you choose to do. Uh, what you choose to do is fine for yourself. I don't force my preferences onto my students. You know, and that there, yes and no. Yeah, yes, that, that's basically what we're saying here is, is that it's not about your preferences, it's about their preferences. And, and as a teacher, teaching is about the teacher. It's not about, excuse me, teaching is about the student. It's not about the teacher. It's not about what I know, it's what you learn. If the students aren't learning, you're not teaching. So there's certainly a truth that if you don't respect their path. On the other hand, there are times where you get the smart ass student, which you, I've heard 10 examples of here, who can, why is this gonna happen? And how does this work? And how do you know? Sometimes you gotta smack them in the head and say, shut up and just do what I tell you to do because you're not far enough along in this field to, to strip away or to chest. So there are times where you're going to impose your own view of things on the student. Uh, which is may not always be functional. It may not be what they need, but it's in the, in, and this is part of the whole teaching process. We can talk about another time, but in the teaching process, there, if, if the person already has, uh, is detailed in, in martial arts and you're helping them refine, yeah, you don't push, but you're, you don't have a choice. All you have is your way of seeing things. And that's the other side. There's no objective truth here. Remember, that's ideals. There's no objective truth. There's just subjectivity. That's all there is, is individual subjects and subjectivity. You cannot teach without imposing your subjectivity because it's all you know. I can't get into teach your attitude. I can't teach your attitude. I can't get into the side of your head and your body and your life and know what you need. I can only help guide you as best as I can. So I say, yes, you're absolutely right. That, that's, that's what Bruce Lee says you should do. But practically speaking, as you train students, you, all you have is what you know. And all I know is what works for me. So I'll show you what works for me and try to help figure out what will work for you. I'm just helping you figure out your path. So there's an element where you're sort of stuck because what else are you going to do but what you know? So your subjectivity is always good. So the trick is to know when you're doing it. It's not that you don't impose your subjective framework. It's not that you don't impose your JKD on a student's JKD. It's, that's going to happen. 
It's, it's about you being aware of doing that. And so you can control it and do it appropriately because there's no such thing as saying, here's the objective truth. Let me, you go find it. It's your finding your path and I'll do my best. And, you know, with a good student teacher relationship, you kind of work it out. And at the very beginning, it's just shut up and do the form the way I tell you to. And over time, you know, and, and it is in a position when I first started with Ron, you know, Ron, teach me what he knows. And, and I asked, I went to Ron because I wanted to learn the Mook Jong. I want to learn the dummy. He wanted to teach me sticks and I want to learn the dummy. So he got mad at me, taught me the dummy, refused to teach me sticks for like three years. But but it's it's, uh, um, you know, it's 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 about not just imposing, it's about knowing that you will impose your view and you need to do it consciously. So you do it in a way that best guides the student. Really good question. Well, we really enjoyed you having here and I know we'd want to have you back, definitely, because you've really, really turned, uh, opened our minds a lot to understanding. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to go back and read the Tao Chi Kune Do as soon as I get home. But in and the meantime, I'm going to rewatch this episode it. five times too. What's that? I'm going to rewatch this episode five times. Yes, for sure. And, yeah. Uh, so, um, but in saying that, we got to wrap up and we got to get good notes there. there, Larry. Is there anything we need to cover? I do want to say that I'm, I, I, you know, I do this for fun. And if any of you need me, call me. If you have something going on at your school and you need you need a philosopher and you can't find one in the yellow pages, call me. I'm I'm free. I don't I don't I don't do this. This is not my. I make my money in academics, uh, and so uh, this this for me is just sheer fun. Uh, you know, I wrote that book for Ron and gave it to him. So he doesn't, you know, it's, it's this is stuff I do. So if anyone, any you guys need stuff in JKD family, we're all family. Just let me know. I'll be glad to jump in, help you guys any way I can. Yeah, Steve helped me tremendously on that book. I mean, I, I always tell him, like, you can't even sound intelligent. You know, I, I had my basic work there and I'm like, Steve, and he sat down with me and then he was kind enough uh, to write a section on uh, uh having handicaps in the martial arts i don't like to be a uh, say disabled because that's in fact maybe can we touch on that for a second before we close we got we got a little bit of time and, and i'd actually like to uh if you had a chance to give my book away which clip we're giving my book away right that's, so that's, that's uh, it and uh so uh uh master steve here has a section in it and he wrote it on being uh uh, uh having injuries in the martial arts and and I've had so many people, I mean, I've been injured, we're all injured, but some people way more extreme than the other. And, and I can empathize to a point, but I've had students with MS and cerebral palsy. And I've had people like Steve, uh, several people with like lower leg dis uh, disabilities uh, where we're, uh, you know, like, I hope it's okay, Steve. But oh yeah, no, 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 it's, it's important. It looks like somebody took an ice cream scooper and took three scoops out of his cap. You know, yeah, it's probably like lost it, yeah. Yeah, I, I had uh, uh, I got hit by a pickup truck and a motorcycle it shattered the tibia and fibular compound. I lost a lot of the lower leg, snapped the femur, broke my back, uh, and and I got a ticket for driving without a headlight from the cop. <laughs> so my headlight blew out. Uh, and I spent uh, years be learning to walk. I, I've I've had twenty some surgeries and and walk kind of funny. Uh, but like I said, if I get my hands on you, you're in big trouble. And Ron's taught me that. Here, here's my bottom line view, bottom line view. And I, I like the word cripple for myself because it cracks me up. I was good. And we, we, we try to appropriate words. We all do that. Uh, when, when you're from a, 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 a marginalized group, you always appropriate the words of the oppressor. This is why African-Americans will use the N-word, like Jews like me, will make crippled Jews like me will make all sorts of jokes. I, my, my roommates used to, I have so much metal in me, my roommates used to call me the $6 million Jew. And, you know, it's just, you know, if you're not making fun of that, that's how you laugh your way through. I'm doing a lot of work on uh, Asian American Pacific Islander hate issues and issues that are going on right now. And it's the same kind of thing, you just adopt the language. Uh, but I don't think that's what matters. I think what matters is to understand that Everybody is, everybody is different. We are all what they say, differentially abled. Everyone has different abilities. If you are tall and thin, short and squat, if you're fast or slow, if you jump, Ron is really fast. He runs like a man, even when I had two legs, I couldn't run like that, you know? And, and so some people could, even when I had two legs, I'm a stocky guy, I can't jump that way. We all are built differently, but more importantly, I was at a Mars event once and I was with, I won't say who it was, uh, but he was filming. And I said, so why aren't you working out? He goes, oh, I have a shoulder injury. So what's wrong with the rest of you? You know, it's, it's, it's you know, so strap your arm in so you're not using it and do some chi out with your right hand. 
You know, what happens if you walk into a fight and the first way it starts is someone throws a roundhouse kick and blows your left knee out? Welcome to my world. You're now fighting on one leg. And, and if you think that every altercation you're going to have is going to happen when you're physically ready for it, you know, guess again, it can happen at any time. And I always say anybody, the disabled, the disabled is the only minority group anyone can join at any moment. OK, anyone can, can become disabled like that. And I don't just mean being in a car accident, being paralyzed. I mean, you could just wreck trash your shoulder somehow, and that shoulder's just never the same. And now you've got to adjust your style. As you get older, something's going to happen. The body decays, the body that you just can't do what you did when you were 20 or 20. I was sitting with Diana up at the Cold Steel uh, event, and there was these two, two youngsters was fighting with staffs. And Diana looks at me, she goes, what, look, I couldn't look at all that power, all that just raw power coming out of this kid. How do you, I couldn't deal with, not only did your technique is, you know, when you're young, you have that energy and that power. When you're older, you're going to, guess what? Things are going to happen. Your knees are going to burn out. Cartilage is temporary, guys. Cartilage, whether it's in the knees or the elbows, that's temporary stuff. You burn that out, you burn it out. Uh, and so the reality is not to look, don't look to the margins. Don't look to the people who are extreme. Don't talk about disability with those who have MS, those who are in wheelchairs, those who have, a, that, that's the extreme and that's important. And don't idolize us. Don't tell us, oh, you, you know, Ron, Ron would, if my leg would go bad, he'd shove a bench under my knee and say, keep going. And we'd shove a bench in and we'd just keep going no matter how bad it was. Great. And everyone would say, good for you. Screw you good for me. I'm just doing what I got to do. What everybody's got to do, do what you got. I'm not, I'm not special. I'm nobody's hero. And nothing I do is heroic. And, that, and that's my view is, uh, you know, obviously it wasn't that important in their life to where they said, all right, that's past me now. I'm going to let it go. I can't let this go. I've had yeah. injuries and it's part of me, but uh, we, we are coming on the hour. I, I've yeah. got, to, I've got to wrap this up. I hate to wrap it up. I love having you. Um, again, I'm going to watch this episode five times. I want to make you a weekly staple in this. I wish I could. <laughs> but uh, so uh, we got to talk about a couple things before we sign off. Uh, Star Wars days, it's coming May the 4th. Hey. So we, we filmed uh, an interview with Diana that's going to air on the 4th or Revenge of the 5th. Get it? Uh, so, so now we, are we going to do that in two sections, Ron? Uh, no, you know what? Gonna I'm going to do it in one. Let's okay. do it in one because I mean, uh, you know, if that's okay, I'd rather because I think it's, it's a little longer, it. but it's going to be awesome. It's it's a great one. We should, we had reported. Yeah. And then uh, the website, we got to talk about that real quick. Uh, May is the big launch. And I'm not Can I let you let you guys go do this? I, I actually have a meeting in about three minutes. I need to jump into. So uh, I just excuse. Thanks so much for the All opportunity right. to chat so much, today. Sir. Thank you. You know, Steve. available Steve. anytime for anybody. Thank you. Very good. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. Take care. Uh, I wish I could give you a hug, brother. Love you. Soon enough. Uh, big hugs and kisses to die, too. All right. Hey. All right. So, all right. So, uh, we have the Diana interview. We have the website. So, let's hit that out for everybody real quick. Um, May, big launch. We're not giving an exact date yet, but May is the promise, correct? Exactly. In Perfect. May. We're, 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 we're getting closer, but it probably toward the end of the May, but... Um, that's that's our first phase, and it's a lot of big changes. Ron has created a lot of new material. A lot of people have, you know, voiced their opinions about their missing pieces. Larry went through that. We've been working together and getting all that to piece together. And Ron's been working nonstop getting. We keep bugging him for more material. So that's yeah, going to be my, awesome. Yeah, my problem. I'm, I'm not a one man show, but I'm close to it. With COVID, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I have I have a, 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 a friend of mine, Dwayne. He's he's starting the video stuff for me, and I have. One partner that you know, well, I'll, I'll one or two people that I'll I'll trust being by. I'm uh, vaccinated uh, vaccinated now. I'm starting to get a little gutsier being out there. You know, it's funny. Like like I know I know we're coming to close, but at the start of this pandemic, I was Diane and I were talking about our year, and I remember like the first big week or two when everybody was scared to death we had to go to the store and it was a little six-year-old or five-year-old boy running he kept running at me and i stopped started running from him and i i had to stop and laugh i go i'm literally scared of this little kid he's running right at me and i don't want to catch this virus who knows if he has it i don't want to make his parents mad like you're by you're touching my kid to get him away from you but it was just crazy i was running around like a madman in a store and this kid 
I don't know if he, I, he thought I was a, you know, a game, but he was running after me after that. And I just thought of how ridiculous I looked at that time. So, you know, with the year gone by, you know, we, we kind of got a handle on maybe a lot of the do's and don'ts. Although a friend of mine who had just filmed with me a week ago, uh, uh, Richard Lee from Washington, got COVID, got it. And, and uh, I, I don't think he minds me saying it. He's just said it to others, but he was just like, damn it. I was just set to go get my vaccination and I got it. So he's doing okay, but he's not feeling real well, but he's, he's going to survive. But uh, anyway, back onto this. I'm filming more, but I'm editing most of this myself. So, you know, and, and I've got other things on the plate. I've got so much footage stockpiled that I've got to get that you guys haven't even seen yet. So as I get it, I'm throwing it in there. You guys can do your thing with it from there, but uh, we're filling a lot of the holes in, in, in the online training that people are. We're, we're, we're changing a little bit on the way we do our subscription. We're mainly going to a yearly subscription because mm -hmm. it's been a really hassle for trying to get people to get their payments through. And but it's so going to be cheaper be, for those people, it's, right? It's going to be less expensive on the year for sure. Yeah. Uh, so you're getting more bang for your buck. That's the way we try to put it together. So, you know, I mean, it literally is going to come to about 16, 70 bucks a month when you look at it that way. So, I mean, almost all my photography thing is um, sub are on subscriptions now. I mean, whether it's Adobe, whether, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using, you know, downloads to, to access different photos and stuff like that. You know, everything's on a yearly subscription. So we thought this would be a better way. Uh, it's, it's less expensive and we're going to give you a lot more material. So um, that's going to be awesome. And Hey, Larry and Ron, I'm down here in, I tell you, in Cancun, and we love this Palace Resorts. We actually stay uh, at the Grand Moon, and I'm telling you, this will be a perfect place for a Mars camp. Perfect. Right on the beach, have access to everything. Your wives are going to love it. They're going to love being able to go to the spa during the day where we're out training. Is there diving That's for Larry? We got diving. Well, we could send him over. Uh, to Cosimo, you know, he, he, that's why he likes that. Cause he's a diver. <laughs> they were telling me today, I go, yeah, my buddy, you know, he has it at Cosimo. He goes, he must be a diver because they can, from, from that resort there on the palace, they can just basically jump right off. You know, I go, yeah, but there's no beach for me, man. It's all rocks. I said, I love the beach. So yeah, well, we'll talk about that later. I've already had one of the Mars guys when he saw me here says that would be a cool place to have the camp. I go, yeah, I'm working on it, man. I'm working on it. So. I don't know. You look hot and sweaty. Is there a place a little less dry? <laughs> yeah, depends on the season, right? Yeah, hey, speak, you know. Speaking of which, I got to throw that out there. But uh, since you're in the Caribbean, one of my favorite shots on one of my trips there, uh, our our big uh, next uh, registration deadline is going to be, um, I believe it's May 7th on our Caribbean camp, which is good. But if you guys are interested or just go read a little bit more about it and the adventures that we put together, it's MarsCaribbeanCamp.com. And you can check out some of the things that we've got planned for you guys, which is good. Um, but just keep in mind, uh, we are limited to 36 people and we're getting close to that number. I think we're less than 10 spots available at this point. if I remember right, speaking of scuba diving, how about that one I took, right? It'll so, fill. It always does. Oh yeah. Yeah. Every one of these is sold out, which is great. So you guys keep that in mind, which is good. And then, yeah. I mean, that's the I'm best. not scuba diving, but we're going to go on a snorkel tour on Saturday. Uh, I, well, only because the guy showed me the photos there and I go, oh man, I'm bringing my camera. That's what I'm going to do. A lot of photography. Got to do it. Can you, do, do you go underwater with your cam? Do you have that ability? No, I, I can buy a housing for it, okay. but uh, I'm not taking this camera that I got with me anywhere that I could lose it. So, yeah. All right, gentlemen. So uh, I loved having Steve go on. And, yeah, he was awesome. And, uh, I mean, he's uh, it's no lie. I talk to him often, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get hit with certain emails and I have a knee jerk reaction. My wife always would call Steve. So I get all proud of myself. I'm like, Hey, I called Steve today. She's like, why? I go, because this guy said this and you didn't need to tell me to call Steve. I called him and he'll, he usually says, just mail me it. And, and at times he'll tweak what I say, or he'll take the ego out of what I say. And he'll just paint people in a corner with facts. And I found, you know, he's, he's, He's pretty good. He's got a, a great bulletproof vest. I'll say that, you know. So I love the guy. All right. So, gentlemen, till next time. All right. Well, I'm going to go hit the pool. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Go have them. Got a couple more drinks. Reaction. I'm going to get my blue Hawaiians down tonight, man. <laughs> yeah, I got to go get on the road and drive 20 hours. So you have an extra drink for me, will you? Yeah. Okay. Me too. All right, brother. All right, guys. We'll see you yeah, next week. week.
All right. Bye-bye. Later. Bye-bye.